transparent community, our list is not exactly that clean all the time. Uh, I would add many things to that list. I thought back when I first came to Christ that my New Year's resolution would have been to stop looking at porn. That's not on the list, right? For some of you, your New Year's resolution is to make it another five minutes without doing drugs. You see? For some of you, your New Year's resolution is to figure out how to continue in a posture of humility and apology to a person you've deeply wounded who's still struggling to get over it. That's all up there on there, but see, it's not on that list, but it's in the one we're living this is not new. It's the Babylonians, they think, that actually started kind of this New Year's celebration kind of a thing. But the Romans really kicked it into gear. Remember that the god Janus, that January is named after, was symbolized this way. These two faces, one looking back and one looking forward. Research on how to keep a resolution is all over the map, but the best I could kind of collate of all the research says this, that those who write them down, they're about 92% more likely to follow through. Those who join a group get an accountability group to help them, 46% more. Those who find a buddy, someone that'll do it, about 22% more. All of those things play in to helping us just do better. So whether you made a resolution or not is really not a big deal. Let's face it, if you made one, you wanted it for some reason. If you made a resolution, you must have wanted something, right? You might have wanted to, you know, get in shape. Well, there's a reason for that. You might have wanted to continue your recovery. There's a reason for that. You might have said, I wanted to be a better sister, better mother, better brother. You might have said, well, you know, I need to be more kind and thoughtful to the person I'm dating. If you're married, you might actually say the same thing. Dating doesn't stop just because you said, I do. They all agree on this, that the real question that leads to success is, is it worth it? Is it worth it? Is what I'm wanting to do, does it mean so much to me that I really couldn't imagine my life not doing it? So what I want you to do is return our attention to Scripture. I want you to look at how Scripture talks about what's really worth it. I'm going to ask you to write down these phrases. They're very short. They're just a few words, but I want you to write them down. I want you to take them with you to see some things that Scripture says. Here's how we know something's worth it. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1 is where we'll begin. As a prisoner of the Lord, the Apostle Paul writes this, I urge you to live a life worthy of your calling. So God has given you a calling in life. God says you're worth more, capable of more. You need to dream bigger than you've ever dreamed. I'm all about that. I've given you a calling. And God says, trust me, my calling for you is worth whatever changes you'd have to make to embrace it. Philippians 1.27, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel, in a nutshell, is this. When God gets involved, everything can change. When God got involved with the ancient patriarch of the people of Israel, his name was Abraham, this dude was advanced in age. His wife was far beyond childbearing years. God told them, you will have a son, and they did. And the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 3 says, the gospel was announced to Abraham in advance. When God gets involved, all things can change. So when Jesus Christ is born, lives teaches, lives a life that was prepared to sacrifice on our behalf. He died and was rose again and ascended back to heaven. And he is in our place in heaven, interceding for us. That's good news. God says when you know that, good 
things can happen. So for the sake of the gospel, it's worth it. Colossians 1.10, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord. Right? Live a life worthy of the Lord. So what are the three we have so far? Worthy of the calling. Worthy of the gospel. Worthy now of what? Worthy of the Lord. Can you imagine somebody even saying, I don't know, I don't know if Jesus is really worth it. You know, I mean, what's he ever done for me, you know? Oh, my goodness, no. If, something, if it's about him, yeah, I'll do it for Jesus. Oh, look at the next one. It's close. 1 Thessalonians 2.12. Encouraging and comforting and urging you to live lives worthy of God. We're doing this for God. I'm thinking about the iconic movie. The Blues Brothers. You got these two guys sitting in a stolen cop car. Sunglasses on. Going to save an orphanage they grew up in. And they say the famous words, we're on a mission from God. So the fact that we're probably going to go to prison over this, it's worth it. Because it's for God. So what are the four we have so far that are always worth it? The calling of God, the gospel, Jesus himself, and God. But there is one more, and it snuck up on me. I'm sharing it with you because the Lord shared it with me. I did not know this until he showed this to me in the word. Romans chapter 16 and verse 1 and 2. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon in the church in Sincrea. Now, if you're not familiar with this place, Sincrea, you're probably more familiar, if you know the Bible a little bit, with a place called Corinth. And Corinth was like a Tri-Cities area, and Sincrea was one of their ports. So if you were to Google Corinth, you would see Sincrea nearby. There was a church there. This lady was one of the deacons in the church there, but she's on a mission. So notice what Paul says. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way that is worthy of his people. Huh. I underlined that. I circled it. You know why? Because I get it. The calling is worth it. The gospel is worth it. The Lord is worth it. God is worth it. But what about God's people? Are they worth it? So it was like, hey, man, we got this really cool thing. We can do this for the church. And you're like, yeah. Dude, it would be better if you did this better. It would be better for the whole body of Christ. Yeah, I'll see. Some people leave the body of Christ. They get moved by a job or whatever, and we throw a party. Other people leave, get moved by a job, and we're like, yeah. You see, we get it that God matters, that Jesus matters, that the gospel matters, that the calling matters. But what about the people of God? Do they matter? Here's what you need to know. This is important. Do you see all the verses I just put up on the screen? Those are all the times that that word worthy is used in the entire New Testament. You got all of them. That's a very small cluster, isn't it? So you better believe that the body of Christ matters like those other four things. Are you hearing the word of the Lord? So how important is Jesus to you? Oh, he's everything. So the body of Christ should be as well. Would you do it for God? Oh, of course. Would you do it for the body? Hmm. Are you excited about the calling of God in your life and the dreams he's laying out? Yeah, man, I'll do it today. Would you do it in a manner worthy of the people of God? This takes a change in mindset. Would you look with me at Philippians 2, Philippians 2 and verse 1? He's going to show us how to think together with God. Let's move ahead to chapter 2 and verse 1. He writes, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Holy Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. Now do nothing 
out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. In humility, value, value others above yourself, looking not to your interests alone, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, you need to have the mind of Christ. Well, what is that mind? Who, being in very nature God, did not regard his equality with God something to be held on to for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue would acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Now notice he says, with Jesus as your example, there's a way to go about showing the body of Christ that they count. With Jesus as your example, there's a way to go about showing the body of Christ that they count. So I want you to look at what he gives us here. He gives us four crucial steps. I want us to look at four steps of becoming one. So we come together in these four steps. Number one, you live into the routines. Let's skip to this slide. We live into the routines of oneness. You live into the routines of oneness. One of our families in the church here had a great idea that I, I just thought was fantastic. They have teenage children, so they made a decision to increase the unity of their family that in the evening they had a bucket on their table and everyone at a certain time had to put their cell phones in the bucket. Everyone had to do it. Parents included. Well, of course, for a while they just sat there and stared at their hands where their phones used to be. But eventually they figured out, ha, you're still here. Wait a minute, I'm married, I have kids, I have parents, yes. I have a sibling, yeah, you haven't known it for the last four years since you got your smartphone, right? You see, oneness is a routine. This morning in our Bible classes, Adam and uh, Bill were teaching us about the discipleship pathway at North Atlanta. The very first thing they're asking everyone who wants to be a part of this church is, will you live into the rhythm of a routine that puts you in the proximity of the body of Christ? That we're spending time together in worship, spending time together in our small groups, spending time together in Bible class, spending time together in recovery, spending time together over a cup of coffee, helping each other grow. Will we grow into the routines of oneness number two will we make love first the baseline of our love what does that mean not everything we call love is love now bad love does not snuff out our desire for good love but you live long enough you know the difference amen amen we figure out the difference. That doesn't mean we still don't hunger for good love, but we know bad love from good love eventually. So God says, let me explain something. You live into my love, and you'll be better at loving others. You get the way I love you, others will feel an upgrade in the way that you love them. Number three. Now, I saved this one because this is maybe the hardest one on the list. And I'm not kidding. I wanted to warm up to this one. So here we go. Build up the value of others in your own mind. You see, here's what happens. We are somehow either perceived or real we're wounded by another person. Now, I admit that sometimes we might perceive that they wounded us and they didn't, and we've got to kind of mature through that, but they may have absolutely won 100% wounded us. Either way, real or perceived, no human being should have to mount a campaign so that they can eventually come back into your good graces and be loved by you. No sibling should have to somehow somehow 
mount a campaign of many good deeds to where finally they're worthy of being loved again in the family. Loved again. Now here is a personal rule I've placed on myself. You remember, if you were here last week or you watched the lesson online, you know that we asked four really important questions. Where do you do your best thinking? When do you do your best thinking? How do you do your best thinking? Why do you do your best thinking? So when we get around to the where, I do some of my best thinking when I have my a leaf blower on and I'm blowing leaves. Okay? So I'm doing thinking. Here's what I want you to know. I made this commitment. I will not give myself permission to think of another person in a negative way without thinking of them in a positive way. Because what's easy to do? It's easy to stack up other people's sins against them. Right? It's easy for us to create a ledger of all the ways that they've done bad or all the ways that they are insufficient of our respect and our love. But you know that God, in his love, created in his heart a place to incubate love for you when you were still his enemy. You had not mounted a campaign to get God's love. God had mounted a campaign to come and find you and show you his love. That's why in this church, we are committed to 1 John chapter 4 and verse 19. We love because he first loved us. God loved us before he created us. He loved us before we loved him. He loves us while that list of resolutions goes unfulfilled. You know what one of the harder things was for me? Let me get real with you for a minute. Let me tell you one of the harder things for me. Because of how I started out in life, the day that I was baptized into Christ, I literally went back to my dorm room in college, gathered up all my pornography that I had, threw it in a black trash bag, and threw it away. The day I was baptized. I was immersed in sin, and then I got immersed in the sin remover. Jesus Christ. But you get where I'm coming from on this. Shake that yes, nor maybe, or at least not in your mind. But you know what part of the problem was? Let me tell you, because I'm going to get straight with you. I thought that as long as I could stay pure in that way, God would love me more. You resonate with anybody? That you think you can kind of get things right so God that will love you more? You understand God can't love you more. His love was never insufficient in the first place. His love was never imperfect in the first place. He wasn't struggling to love you in the first place. He wasn't wondering if you'd ever get it together enough that he would finally love you. He created you in your mother's womb. He knit you together. You've never cried a tear that he didn't taste the salt of your own tears. He's fought for you when you didn't know to fight for yourself. He loved you when you didn't love yourself. He fought against the hate you had in your own heart with the love that he had for you in his heart. He's always loved you that deeply always so see your righteousness doesn't earn his love and you know why that's important because we treat other people like that we wait till they get it together and they get it together long enough and then they can earn our love oh that's a sick way to live that's a malfunction of love so you got to build up the value of others in your own mind how many of you could just say, man, that's tough? Can you say that? Oh, yeah. I can say it. Can you say it? Go give it a shot. That's man, that's tough. What if someone's done you wrong? Man, that's tough. I was in the eighth grade. We had this kid. His name was Keith. He was a big bully at our school. One night, there was a big commotion out in my driveway. Turns out Keith is trying to steal our car. My dad is out there in his whitey tighties in the middle of the night, dragging Keith out of the car, getting a hold of the keys. Well, about a week and a half later, I'm in my junior high, junior high when Keith was getting into this, and I'm standing in the bathroom using the restroom, and guess who steps up into the restroom right next to me? Keith! What in the world? I can't go nowhere. I wanted to. I didn't want to be around him. You know Why? Because all of Keith's sins were worse than mine. I'd made peace with my sins, just not his. I'll bet some of you have made peace with your own sin, but just not the sin of your neighbor. 
It takes a lot of work to build up the value of another person in your own mind. Number four, upgrade your interests to be worth the journey. You notice he didn't say you couldn't be interested in your own thing. He just said don't be interested in your own thing only. You remember how Jesus taught us to love others as we love ourselves? You got to learn to love yourself if you're going to love others well. So it's not that you don't love yourself. You just don't love yourself only. It's not that your interests aren't important. Your interests are very important. Your interests may be generated by the Holy Spirit. It just means that your interests are important and so are others. Your opinions are important or you wouldn't have them. But differing opinions in the life of another person are important or they wouldn't have them. That doesn't mean your opinions are right. But I'll bet you don't hold an opinion you think is wrong. But until you believe that someone else's opinions are really important, yours won't get upgraded because you won't listen to theirs. You get how this works? I used to hear people say we come to church, some good meaning person would get up here and talk to us and they say something like this just forget about yourself it's not about you I would sit there and think I ain't doing that well I probably need this like I'm in secret I'm gonna think about myself a little bit because I actually need this you see I didn't understand the, the, the ministry of Christ the ministry of Christ isn't that I quit thinking about me and only think about you it's that both of us are thinking about each other We've upgraded our interests. You do realize that if you want to succeed in recovery, you need to be helping someone else recover. Right? Don't we give that gift and pass it on if you want to succeed in recovery? If you want to know the joy of your salvation, tell someone else about Jesus Christ. You want to know what God has done for you, you tell someone else about what God has done for you. You want to know why the calling is worth it, you tell someone about what God has done in your life. You want to know why the gospel is worth it, tell somebody about the difference that the gospel has made in your life. You start a sentence out with, let me tell you what Jesus has done for me, and you will be reminded of how much it matters. But I'm going to say something else. You look lovingly on the body of Christ because Jesus does. If it's important to him, it needs to be important to us. I remember... A man remarking, after my father had passed away, I remember a man remarking, he said it this way. He said, one of the things that meant the most to me about your dad is he came to the church through Jesus. He came to the church through Jesus. I said, what do you mean? He said he always looked at the church through the eyes of Jesus. That's why he loved it so much. Now, if you know a little bit of my dad's story, he'd have had a lot of reasons to not think the church was all that great. He could have shrugged his shoulders and said, yeah. but you see, when you look at the church through the lens of the one who gave his life for it, the church brightens up. It becomes beautiful again, and you enjoy it, and you become excited to be a part of it. So let me ask you something. How could we ever hope to be one if we didn't understand how beautiful and valuable and worthy is the body of Christ? Oneness will come when we believe that each other really matter. Would you pray with me? Father, we come before you right now. We're going to give our hearts to you. We're going to seek your will and seek your ways. Father, we want to be one, but we realize that the Holy Spirit's got to do some work inside of us, so we open our hearts to that right now. I'm going to ask the whole church to stand right now. I'm going to ask our shepherds and others who are willing to be prayer warriors today to go up on the sides. I'm going to pray that every person who is ready to seek you in prayer, seek you for salvation, seek you for the calling, seek you for the gospel, seek you for the body of Christ, seek you for healing from addiction, seek you for healing from disease, seek you for healing for broken relationships. I'm going to pray, Father, right now a prayer of healing over this church, and I'm praying, Father, that as we desire to be one, we will actively, tangibly live as one right now, Father. 
I pray that people will begin to make their way to these shepherds, make their way to these prayer warriors. If we're sitting right here and you're willing to pray with someone right now, I pray that you'll just make it evident. Step out into the aisle. Make it evident that you're willing to pray with people. Open your heart to that and you look around. If you need prayers right now, look around for the people that are waiting on you. Don't hold it in. Don't go one more day. Don't let yesterday be quitter's day. Don't let next week be quitter's week. Father, right now, Father, what we pray for is your anointing of the Spirit in this place that chains will be broken, that hearts will be mended, that lives will be restored. In the name of Jesus, we continue this prayer as we sing.